Hello and welcome to the latest in our interview series as part of the NYU Research Group on Transnational Everyday Life. With us today is Professor Catherine Robson of the English Department at NYU. Her new book, Heartbeats, Everyday Life in the Memorized Poem, has just come out from Princeton. So I thought we'd ask, uh, we'd begin by asking rather, um, about the genesis of this project, um, the different, um, um, let's say, uh, motivations and, and, and uh, sort of second thoughts that you document all the way through the book. Um, there, it does have a long genesis, and I actually spend quite a bit of time in the acknowledgements tracking the different phases because I was given support for significantly different projects to start with, so I felt I needed to acknowledge this. I started to write a book um, about the problem of unburied bodies mm -hmm. in um, Victorian life, um, and I knew I wanted to think about um, Felicia Hemmons' poem, Voiced on the Burning Deck, which to me seemed a wonderful example of a uh, story about a body that could never be buried properly. The, the, the child that is standing on the deck of the ship stands there so long, he's faithful to his duty that he's blown to smithereens um, over the Med Mediterranean in the Battle of the Nile. Um, and it was a poem I really wanted to think about because I knew it had this special presence in people's heads, certainly people of my grandparents' generation, even my parents' generation, and also to an extent to myself as well. I knew for a long time I'd known the first line, The Boy on the Burning Deck, mm -hmm. and didn't know why I knew it. And so I was very interested in the idea that a fragment of that poem had lodged itself in many, many, many heads, um, and that there was something about the, the story of a body that couldn't be buried, which had a sort of similar form to the idea that this, this poem had never really been put to rest. It continued, it lived on in parodic forms, but fragments of it were on all these minds. And it was quite a while before I realized that um, I would have much more success with this project if I could think about not so much the figure of unburied bodies but this idea of the persistence of certain fragments of literature and it was a moment when I realized I needed to stop looking at this as a kind of thematic idea and more to think about what, what the engine of distribution uh, had been, the engine of dissemination that had put that poem into so many heads, allowed it to have this, this, this lingering on in culture. Um, and it was at that moment I kind of moved around to think, actually I think I'd like to know about the history of recitation in mm -hmm. schools. And I think this coincided with um, um, another feeling I've been having increasingly over the years, which I think connects particularly with this research group's interest in the everyday. And this is why I had the word every day um, in my title. I, I got increasingly sort of fed up with the, the sort of the demographic injustice of the huge attention that we pay to a very small number of people, namely writers in English departments. Uh, and at the time, this is going back a bit, the, the lack of attention we uh, pay to the huge numbers of readers um, the, so we, and, and along with that, the attention we gave incessantly to the, the moment of composition mm -hmm. and not so much to all of those moments of consumption or the reception moments. So there was definitely a sort of desire um, to go to the more common in my, in my estimation. So instead of looking at privileged authors and moments of writing, to think about what, what ways could one get at literature's importance in everyday life for everyday people. Mm -hmm. And so turning around and starting to think about uh, school recitation, about the place of the literary in a mass education system satisfy quite a few of those different demands on my part to find a different way mm -hmm. of doing my scholarship. So this is a recovery project of sorts then, is that a fair way to...? Um, it certainly turned into um, much more of a recovery project than perhaps I had hoped. I had, I think, what was, um, you know, I'd been trained very much in a sort of new historicist school and I had done what I think a lot of us did. We'd, I relied on the works of kind of 
historians of earlier moments, I'd, whenever I'd been working on a topic, I'd go and find the nice, dodgy, historical study filled with lots of uh, details and interesting and un uninteresting. And I'd done that lit cherry picking. I'd pulled out a little moment and then gone and joined it to my reading of this text or another. When I started to look at this topic, I thought, well, someone must have written a history of school recitation. It's a really big topic. And there was nothing out there. And it was that moment where I thought, oh no, I am going to have to write this history myself, which, you know, was a wonderful moment, but also a moment where I thought, well, there goes, you know, five, six, seven, eight years <laughs> of my right. life. Um, and particularly when I decided to expand the study from a study of recitation in Victorian elementary schools, when I realized, actually, I need to go to the 20th century. There is just as much, if not more, to say about this phenomenon in the 20th century. But not only that, I decided to make it a comparative study and to look at American education because I was writing this book in this country, um, I knew that um, Americans have a much more um, emotive response to the idea of a memorized poem than um, British people do, and that, that was interesting to me, but it did mean I had to build my knowledge of American elementary education and its history from the ground up, so common school movement, Horace Mann, everything, I had to go right. and do all of that. And I'm, I'm glad I've done it, and I feel I've learned a lot more about the everyday in so doing. But it did, it expanded the parameters of the project and expanded the time it took me to do it. Mm -hmm. And the, the book is sort of peppered with these, these kind of moments of, of discovery or sort of serendipity, where you, you'll, you'll stumble across something and you'll recall something. Um, even from your own experience, you mentioned your own grandmother um, reciting mm -hmm. um, and, and the path that that, that led you down. Um, could you talk a bit about um, that, that sort of experience of either reciting or being on the other end and being, being an audience? Because the speaking body itself seems to be, as you, as you say, something that's very difficult to recover and you have to do it through fiction or through, through other means. I mean, once once these individuals are no longer around, mm -hmm. where do we go for the record? As, as you said at the outset, there isn't a mass of scholarly literature that you can build on. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the what's the mine that you that you go to? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's interesting you brought up the the grandmother moment because I mean, I thought quite seriously about whether or not to put that in there because it is the the hokiest thing to do in a way is to sort of wheel out your grandmother as sort of testimony to the past and yet um, I think in our, our own work I mean I think a lot of us we want to understand that which happened which seemed a strange thing why would your grandmother stand up and recite a poem about um, the this, her one poem was um, uh, Sir Henry Newbolt's He Fell Among Thieves, and it's this absolutely startlingly sensationalist mini imperial epic um, about a, a British elite adventurer, explorer, he actually won the Royal Geographic Society medal, but getting his head cut off in the Hindu Kush. I mean, it's deeply disturbing. Um, I mean, it's um, quite sort of the sickening thrill of the, um, the the sweeping sword that separates his head from his shoulders, and you know, I remember listening to my grandmother reciting this poem, and thinking, what on earth had that to do with her life? What did she? Because she didn't comment on the content of it at all. Mm -hmm. um, it was the fact of this was something I had to do in school, and um, trying to find the. Um, Trying to find ways to put explanatory frames around such moments was was was, was very difficult, and um, I make a confession in the introduction that I have had to employ methods which I think are often more analogous to the work of a histo um, historical novelist than of a historian or a literary critic, because I can do all I can to set up as responsible and as flexible a historical context in which to understand a moment, and yet, to get to the center of that moment, I just have to imagine mm -hmm. at a, a, 
a certain point, and I've been doing this for a while, and now it's become a sort of term of art, the, the thought experiment. I, 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 I hadn't heard that when I, and I think I'd started doing that, but trying to imagine what must it have felt like. Mm -hmm. And I think I did a lot of that thinking in relation to the first chapter I wrote, which was the one about Felicia Hemmons, um, Casabianca, because I wanted to think about how must it have felt to the child who had to recite that poem, who found it hard, embarrassing, mortifying, um, potentially um, um, you know, the threat of punishment hanging over it, to try mm -hmm. and understand what it, what it would feel like to be an eight-year-old having to recite that poem in front of your classmates and your teacher, your heart thudding, knowing that if you didn't get it right, you know, you might well feel the rod on your back. Um, spent a long time looking at punishment books, and trying to find out if children were actually beaten for not reciting a, um, a poem properly. Um, but that is the kind of thing you cannot find a record for. Yes, you can go to um, fiction, but fiction is never a, um, doesn't deliver, as we know, um, uh, anything close to a, um, transparent record and I became very interested in why we have so many beating scenes in novels after failed performance of David Copperfield um, 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 I'm particularly fond of uh, Way of All Flesh, the um, Samuel Butler, and I spent quite a lot of time thinking about um, Wooden Brooks because Thomas Mann just does so many different things with recitation in that novel I think the novel ultimately has its own axe to grind, that um, something that I think that has dropped out of our studies of the 19th century, we are so sure that the novel is the king uh, genre of the period, um, but we forget when we act, act it as if it were that you know that's an achieved position that's only come about through our um, placing the Victorian novel as the, the sort of the, the prime object in literary mm -hmm. studies, the poem was absolutely the most important genre. And I think the novel is interested in insisting that it has a kind of kinder, gentler way of doing education um, uh, than, um, uh, you know, so it, it, it's interested in sort of uh, attacking the right of the poem to be the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the treasured object. So I, I treat those scenes with some suspicion. Um, they're lovely to go and analyze, but actually to try and think my way into an everyday classroom on you know wet Tuesday morning in the East End of London in 1897 you can go to the Institute of Education and you can look through inspectors reports you can um, read memoirs of people who attended such schools you can read uh, school teachers autobiographies you're going to get certain glimpses of what happened in that room but to actually try and build up anything like a picture of what actually happened, you do have to be quite creative. You have to imagine your way into it. Speaking of the, the moment of recitation yeah. and it, its position in uh, pedagogical history, um, you do that in your own teaching as well. I know that you, you actually videotape um, students reciting and have done for some time. It's, well, only in the last few years. I mean, I start, I mean, uh, we were talking a moment ago about the big difference, differences in the way that the era of school recitation is remembered in Britain and the mm -hmm. United States. The United States is much more um, sort of sentimental or fervent about the practice. In Britain, everyone is, oh, that was a terrible thing to do, that was part of the bad old days, Victorian education, and we don't want that back, although there are now, in the current government, some voices um, in favour of it. Um, but I was very much brought up in that idea that, you know, poetry is about freedom and self-expression. You know, you don't require children to all recite the same poem. You don't even make them uh, read poems. They write their own poems. You look out the window at the rain and then you write something about you know, what you can see. And that was absolutely the kind of education um, I had um, in primary schools and comprehensive schools in the um, 60s and 70s. Um, and so the idea that I would ask my own students to do it for a long time was just not on the agenda. I saw it as quite a, a repressive um, 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 
thing to do. Um, but I have really turned around in my thinking of it, and now, as you're saying, I do require my students um, um, to recite, and I do video it um, in my large survey courses. Each student has to recite a quatrain from a signed poem, and we have a little tag team recitation of Gray's Elegy or We Are Seven um, stanzas from um, Tennyson's In Memoriam. And then as an extra credit exercise, anybody can recite poem of his or her choice in front of the class, or they can do it in my office, and I also um, interview people about the processes they use to commit a poem to memory and ask them how they're thinking about the poem has changed as a result of the experience. And the reason I changed was that I consider that they've already voted with their feet. They are English majors. They have declared a fondness for this kind of work. To my mind, it is absolutely not the same thing as saying to a class of 32 eight-year-olds, you are all going to memorize We Are Seven, and you are all going to have to perform in front of the class. Um, questions of choice are you know, very much to do with why um, uh, recitation fell out of the curriculum. Uh, but I feel that at this level, teaching the university level, I can ask students to do four lines. It's mm -hmm. nothing. When you think that 150 lines was the standard yeah. fare for a 12-year-old, and, you know, and I'm delighted when you know, one of my undergraduates recites proof rock, 131 <laughs> lines, and we're all amazed he can do it. And I am amazed, and it's, and it's wonderful. At the same time, I'm thinking, to qualify for teacher training, if you were a 16-year-old uh, going through the pupil-teacher apprenticeship system any time between the 18, 1846 and 1910, you'd have had to do 300 lines. <laughs> to, yeah. And the idea of asking anyone to do 300 lines at the moment, that's just... Almost you brought up um, what the memorized poem means to the speaker, and, and in your book, um, um, so much of it deals with um, the the kind of um, um, affective response, or what it means to to possess even a fragment of poetry. You may not have the title, but you have these lines with you, and they, they, they're almost like a possession that can be drawn on or activated um, at any time. And you ask as well whether that changed the way that the, the, way that the speaker, the way that the, the knower um, thought, um, particularly when you, when you discuss class and class movement in the mm -hmm. British context. Mm -hmm. um, during your, your case study of Gray's Elegy? Yes, I mean, because I started with the, um, the Casabianca case study and thinking about, not so much thinking about the words, but the sort of somatic experience of it, um, trying to get to a place where I could claim that the meaning of the words had some effect on um, uh, the child who had learnt it, the adolescent who thought about it, the older person who looked back. Um, this, this was again a, um, a methodological challenge because memoirs and autobiographies that mention the experience of recitation very rarely talk about the meaning of the words. They talk about the thrill of um, dramatic performance, they talk about the kind of almost um, spiritual experience of this sort of being transfigured by recitation. They talk about almost sort of what one might call mouthfeel, that having mm -hmm. lovely rich language in your mouth when perhaps, you know, you had a fairly um, a home without a lot of comfort and then you had La Belle Dame Saint Merci in your head and you had access to this, this richness. Um, so what we would call, you know, the ideological content of a poem very hard to find um, traces of that. And so I had to imagine how it might have felt to have a poem like Gray's Elegy, a poem which to me was an interesting test case because it absolutely was a poem for the, the top class, the highest achieving children. You had to have made it to about 13 um, because the length of the poem meant it was assigned to people only uh, at that level. Um, and I was very interested in sort of thinking about what that poem must have meant to the children of the poor who did well at school, who possibly received a scholarship to go on to the, the grammar school, 
um, to go to a school where their voice sounded rather different from perhaps the other voices mm. um, of the children there. And to think about the irony that um, for Gray in the middle of the 18th century, that poem um, spends so much time thinking about the unlettered, the mute. And so I felt, okay, I'll go forward 100, 150 years, and the children of those rude forefathers who are buried in the country churchyard are now getting a education of five, six, seven years, at the end of which they might encounter this poem. How does that feel to them? But again, it was a, um, um, in the absence of evidence, I had to imagine, I had to think about that. And that's where I really went into the archive of the scholarship boy and mm -hmm. thought about particularly um, Richard Hoggart's ideas about um, the, the split self that emerges from that experience of leaving one class and not quite joining another. Um, and that was, um, I mean, that's the, um, the chapter that I wrote last and that I, and the one I'm sort of continuing to think about for my, for my next project. I'm gonna stay very much with working class voices and particularly um, this, I'm working with this wonderful archive in um, Berlin of um, this amazing, phenomenon that a German phoneticist got funding from the Kaiser in the First World War to go into prison of war camps and record the voices of the regional voices of British private soldiers and this incredible collection of wax cylinders and all the documentation has just been sitting there in a room in Berlin for years and years and years um, and so now all through the this, the poetry project, I kept thinking, if only I could hear these voices, if mm -hmm. only I could hear these voices, and lo and behold, there's this cache of materials. Um, um, this is just one of those lovely archive moments, you go in and you take the lid off the capsule and you smell the wax cylinder, you think, okay, six or seven years to work on here. <laughs> so it's, an, it's a, you know, this strange, it's not the story we expect to hear about the First World War. Right. Um, what did you do in the Great War, Daddy? Well, the Hun made me tell him the story of the prodigal son in my own words and recorded me on a shellac disc. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, but the place where I was able to get hold of what, what people actually thought about a poem uh, was very much in the case study about the um, um, the, unbur the improper burial, the um, Charles Charles Moore's um, Charles Wolfe's poem about the death of the burial of <laughs> Sir John Moore, mm -hmm. and that's when I really went to American archives and found lovely, fascinating instances in which people were quoting that poem and changing the poem, changing the poem in ways they needed it to change. Um, and so that, that was where I was most able to get hold of people responding to the semantic content of a poem rather than its kind of the formal experience of reciting rich words or remembering what it felt to stand up and recite in a classroom. The Sir John Moore chapter is, is the best place I've found to get hold of what that poem, what the words of that poem meant to someone. So, that, that was a very interesting um, experience working on that, largely because I had to do a lot of Civil War history, and again, didn't really know about this, but to find that when, after the Battle of Gettysburg, um, a Patrick Henry Taylor had to bury his own brother, and because he didn't have a coffin, because he didn't have a headstone, wrote out a stanza from Wolf's poem and uh, altered the lines which talk about wrapping the body in this martial cloak, altered it to saying, uh, and wrapped his shelter tent around him, realizing that he so much regarded that poem as his, that he could change the words. And so to me, that was a really interesting meeting point between external cultural object that has become fully internalized and been some is something inside that person that gives tremendous comfort and solace um, at a time when we really had no other resources whatsoever and I think thinking about the poem the poem's role as a source of solace and comfort you know, that's just not something we talk about in the classroom that's something that absolutely would have meant 
some a huge amount to Victorian readers, meant a huge amount to say someone like Matthew Arnold, that once poetry becomes the object of the university, once it becomes something that we subject to scholarly rigour, we side that away. And so one of the things this project has enabled me to do is to think about literature, and particularly poetry, in a you know a much more rounded sense uh, to think about the roles it has played in the effective lives of people. And, you know, that's there are moments in the classroom where we do that, but we tend to think of that as not our job. That's not what we do. We're here to do scholarly rigor, and it fits into our academic uh, credentializing processes. So you don't talk about, you know how this poem helped me through the death of, yeah. you know, sometimes it comes up, you teach in the Moriad, there will always be one or two students who say, actually this poem really helped my mother when, or this is helping me now because, and those are, those are lovely vocabulary to talk about. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's in the Charles Wolfe chapter as well that you mentioned another one of those wonderful moments of, sort of discovery where you, you, you find something inside yourself that you didn't quite know was there. You, you, you mentioned, um, coming to the poem in the 90s as a scholar, but then realizing that you'd actually been been exposed to it much, mm -hmm. much earlier. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that? Oh, yes, that, that is, I mean, it's a book, I think, that I don't know that has a great popularity in uh, for American children, but um, a series of books um, about a, a schoolboy called Molesworth. And the one I knew was How to Be Top. It's written by um, a, a guy called Willems, um, and but I remember very much the illustrations as well uh, by this amazing guy, Ronald Searle, who was a survivor of the, um, uh, the Burma Railway um, prison camps. Um, but Molesworth, um, I probably read these when I was nine, but he's, he's at a minor, minor prep school for a minor, minor public school uh, called um, St. Custard's. And one of the things that I like about the books, going back to them now, is that I think it's the first appearance of the word Hogwarts, which of course Hogwarts really? has huge, the rival school that St. Custard's always playing rugger against are called Hogwarts. And so J.K. Rowling steals, you know, hers is a boarding school story, these are boarding school stories, she steals a load from these. Um, and every now and again you'll know someone who knows how to be top and um, the, the Molesworth tetralogy as it is known. Uh, but in the description of, um, this is all Molesworth diary and it's all written in appalling spelling and lots of um, uh, schoolboy jargon and uh, so forth. Um, but he describes the contents of his English lesson and someone has to, re he has to recite um, the burial of Sir John Moore, sir, at Karana, sir, sir, and the, his recitation of the poem is interrupted by the pings of peas from a pea shooter, and his asking, you know, questions about the strange vocabulary. What's a corpse, sir? Oh, really? Is it a, a corpse? Is a corpse? So you've got these little um, uh, uh, interjections into the the recited moment. So yes, I met that poem when I was nine, but I did not. I'd started studying it because I'd come at it through some work on Thomas Hardy. Uh, and then it was actually, I don't record this in the book, but I was on the steps of the British Library at King's Cross and I saw someone I'd been at university with and she said, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm working on Beryl of St. John Moore. She said, oh, Molesworth. <laughs> and I said, Molesworth. And, and she reminded me that I must have known it at a much earlier age, but mm. because it was a poem that absolutely did not fit into how I thought about war literature. I mean, war literature for, to me was all First World War, all Wilfred Owen, Dulcia de Coromest, uh, Siegfried Sassoon. Um, and so I would not have thought a poem about the burial of a general in the Napoleonic War had any relevance. I mean, my poems were all about Anthem for Doomed Youth, about the burial of the common soldier. So um, you know, that was a nice, that was a moment of finding that I'd had something there already, but I hadn't, I'd never noticed it because it didn't fit into the paradigms and shapes that I had been taught. That's how you look at literature. Can you tell us a bit about the case study as an approach and why you adopted that and what, what you get from it? The case study um, is the most liberating device ever, I think, and I was very much encouraged by the 
design of John Guillory's book, Cultural Capital, and of course he has that wonderful case study of um, Gray's Elegy in his book. So I thought a long time, can I have a case study <laughs> of Gray's Elegy? And then when I realized I'm absolutely not thinking about it in its moment of composition and first dissemination, I'm going to a different, very different sorts of classrooms, a different century. And so uh, I realized I could do that. Um, but for me, it was a limiting device, a way to um, dig rich histories, to build rich penumbra around certain poems that would allow me to say, to give very specific histories that at the same time would allow me to talk generally about the phenomenon of recitation. Books which um, talk generally about, um, you know, give you lots of titles and mention lots of works, but don't actually dig into any one work. I, I, there is a book um, on the uses of poetry in America that, you know, is a mm -hmm. wonderful survey, and yet, um, well, there's a fairly recent one by um, Joan Shelley Rubin, um, and it's, you know, it's a treasure trove of material, but I really wanted the kind of specificity that you can get if you choose one discrete literary object as your focus. Um, and I also, um, you know, I wanted to allow the thematics of my three chosen poems to determine the topic, so I wanted there to be a, um, a very sort of strong back and forth between um, uh, the topic of the poem. So, Boys on the Burning Deck is a very somatic poem about the, the boy's body, and I wanted to think about children's bodies. Um, Gray's Elegy obviously is a huge meditation on class. I wanted to think about uh, what what recitation, what what its relation to class mobility and class structures would be, um, and then the the. the um, the burial of Sir John Moore worked, worked in other ways, this kind of poignant idea of, of, of times of great loss and, and what, what kinds of reparation might be adequate, um, what kinds of cultural materials um, um, could um, stand in for a formal burial um, ceremony and so forth. So choosing three poems and, you know, all, in the scheme of things, fairly short poems, allowed me to have a kind of dense textual object around which I could put layer and layer of um, um, explication of the larger phenomenon of um, school recitation. And also, it's, there's a, there is a sort of a life cycle of the memorised poem built into that, that the first one is very much about young children, the Grace Elegy is really about adolescence, mm -hmm. and um, Beryl Sir John Moore is about what the poem meant to people in later life, so that's kind of my adult chapter. So I'm able to have a, mm -hmm. a kind of um, a life cycle arc by mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. And within each, you're almost tracing the life cycle of the works themselves, of the poems themselves. I was struck, for instance, by um, the way that uh, Casabianca um, changed as its as its rhythm was was regularized. It seemed to have been sort of um, imprisoned by the um, the boy stood on the burn and deck in a, in, in a way that may not have been intended that, it, that perhaps doesn't deserve and mm -hmm. and and the sort of debasement um, in in um, critical esteem of, of the poems that are chosen um, as, as classroom staples like this no and it's I mean what is is, is nice about that argument is you know, you've made the argument just by doing that the boy stood on the burning deck you know um, we applaud poems that depart from jog trot meter, mm -hmm. um, ones that reverse stresses, that do interesting thing with the set meter of a line. Well, actually, Hemans does that. Um, the the you know to put the boy stood on the burning deck. She has reversed uh, the stress pattern there, and so it's absolutely a mimetic line. Uh, it arrests movement. The boy's movement is arrested. But once the poem became the object for the school, everybody reverts to the jog trot 
dominant iambic pattern, the boys stood on the burning deck and they stress on. And it makes it nonsensical. But in that line, we can hear how the process of over-familiarisation changes our access to a work. Um, and it is only by main force can you actually give it the stress pattern mm -hmm. it ought to have because it has become such a derided object. Of course, it's come back now, the poem, you know, since the resurrection of interest in female romantic poets, in the uh, interest in um, poets of nationalism and imperialism and so forth. Um, Hemans is now discussed you know, in very uh, high academic circles, but I was interested in the fact that it was the it was the semantic content that was discussed, not the metrical form. Um, and so, just going to that first line, the line that is remembered, if anything is remembered of that poem in a broader constituency, that the argument is there just in the way it is said. Mm -hmm. So that's another kind of everyday thing I like that it's as it's as plain as the nose on your face, but I think the simplest arguments are sometimes the hardest ones mm -hmm. to make because they are so ingrained in our naturalized way of looking at something. Mm -hmm. The everyday is, is transparent, I suppose, yeah. as so a way of going unnoticed. It's really hard to look at the simple. Asking you about the, the genesis of the project, that, that throughout the book you're, you're sort of continually um, Taking us through your your second thoughts and mm -hmm. and uh, describing the the way that the, um, the the direction and the focus of the project changed and you close with um, with uh, a look at uh, a couple of poems um, Invictus uh, Henley and um, Kipling's If mm -hmm. um, and uh, you mentioned that you you had a particular sort of coda in mind and that that ended up changing and you give us both the the potential coda the idea you originally had and then its its revision could you tell us about that. Yes, well, I had long thought that I wanted to finish with W. E. Henley's Invictus because it is such a recitational classic, um, and I had lots and lots of examples of John McCain reciting it, various other people, but I was most interested in the fact that Tim McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, had left the poem in lieu of a final statement um, the night before he was um, executed. And what was so interesting... From, from memory, right? And he wrote it out, and he signed it as if it was his. I mean, I can recite the poem, if you would like. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Which is quite a poem, um, but the fact that the um, the journalists waiting outside Terre Haute um, Penitentiary when they got the photocopy of um, uh, those 16 lines with Tim McVeigh's signature at the end didn't recognise it as a poem. They thought he'd written it, and then quickly somebody, you know, broadcast and someone said, no, no, that's W.E. Henley, and then who W.E. Henley had to be, was, was explained, he was referred <laughs> to as a 19th century cripple, Gore Vidal did this wonderful thing, <laughs> Henley famously, the one-legged man on mm -hmm. whom Robert Louis Stevenson based um, Long John Silver, Treasure Island, uh, Gore Vidal said, no, no, let's call him Extremities Challenged, which um, um, was, was rather neat, but, so I really wanted to talk about the fact that um, no one constituency can own a poem, that uh, um, what did it mean that th this poem then became a kind of rallying cry for ultra-right American extremists. I have a, a, a 
quite a shocking um, illustration in the book, I think, of a, a company called uh, Surefire who make gun-mounted flashlights who use the poem superimposed upon a picture of the uh, a burning oil derrick in the, the, the Second Gulf War as part of their um, advertising materials. And so I was all set to write about this and to notice that the then the Atlanta bomber quotes it from the bowels of the Supermax talking about how his head is bloody but unbowed as well. And then of course um, Clint Eastwood released a film about Nelson Mandela called Invictus and uh, the importance of the poem to Mandela in his 27 years in Robben Island prison. Um, the story, I'm sure people will know about um, how he gives copy of the poem to the head of the, uh, the captain of the Springboks and the, uh, the Rugby World Cup and all was this Was it really the poem though? It wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, he actually gave him um, a Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena yeah. speech. I mean, I found uh, there is, um, uh, Mandela never mentions um, Invictus in his autobiography, but another of the Robin Island prisoners does recall him reciting it. Um, but once that film was out there, I thought, I can't write my McVeigh ending now. But in a way, it does make the point that a memorized poem is an absolutely mobile cultural object. It, it will belong to anybody who memorizes it. Sometimes it will, it will then become more identified with this individual or that individual. But it is the mobility of these poems, uh, uh, the fact that they entwine themselves within individuals and take on cultural lives in many different kinds that I think makes them a really fascinating object for study. Well, I think that's a wonderful capstone um, to our discussion of the book. Again, it's Heartbeats um, by Professor Catherine Robson, um, and it's just out from Princeton, and we're speaking with her in the NYU English Department. Thanks.